All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, I am Mona Ateya. I am the director of the Institute for Middle East Studies here at GW. Um, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to our annual conference on producing the Middle East, uh, new directions in regional and media politics. Um, you know, we this conference has been 18 months in the works, uh, was scheduled originally for um, th this time last year. And, um, we were really hoping to be able to do it in person, but obviously the circumstances did not allow it. So just gonna make a quick comment about the format. Um, you know, we, we were really trying to um, be sensitive to the Zoom fatigue that we're all experiencing and um, to preserve what's most important about these conferences, which in, in my view is allowing for scholarly exchange and open conversation. And that's why we decided to do the exhibitions with the with pre-recorded presentations and ask the audience to watch that in advance and to leave really the in-person time to conversation and dialogue. Um, so you'll notice the conference is, is broken up over two days over the afternoon um, and each panel uh, has three participants and a discussant moderator who will really um, keep the conversation moving. And we really do welcome the attendees to put questions in the Q&A box. Um, and to be an active part of the conversation. Um, but really the, the thing we're trying to preserve is that sense of community conversation that happens in these spaces. Um, so we'll see how it goes. I, I uh, really appreciate all of the hard work that went into creating the online exhibition and, and the time that had to be carved out to create those video presentations in particular. So thank you to all of the panelists for their really hard, exquisite work. And also thank you to Christian Clinton, um, who's our operations manager, who did the heavy lifting of making all of those videos accessible on, on the webpage and, and making them uniform and a lot of the logistics for, the, for today's conference, um, as well as Elad Raymond and Carissa Gingrich who um, provided um, a support for public publicity and, and so on. Um, I want to uh, put a special thanks to Will Humans, um, who organized this conference um, in the fall of last year uh, when he was interim director of the Institute. And um, I'm gonna introduce Will and then give him an opportunity to really provide some of the context for the intellectual foundations of the conference. Um, so um, Professor Humans is associate professor at GW's um, School of Media and Public Affairs. And his research is on transnationalism, power, and communication, including global news, law, and politics. Um, he is the author of Unlikely Audience, Al Jazeera's Struggle in America, which is with Oxford University Press. Um, and he's a regular contributor to numerous news and media outlets. Um, his, he's currently working on a really exciting project that he might tell us more about, the Arab America TV archives, which he's brought um, to his office and we can see them in the background there. Um, and and uh, anyway, he, he's working on a pretty ex exciting project to digi digitize this archive um, in addition to his other, other scholarly um, projects. So um, without uh, further ado, I'm gonna hand the floor to Will. And I thank you all for joining us and hope that we have two days of really um, fruitful conversation. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to start out uh, by thanking you all for joining, taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I hope that this conference uh, is as generative and promising as it looks like it's going to be. Um, I wanted to start out by just repeating some of the thank yous um, because it's only proper for me to do that, but to, to Professor Atiyah as director of IMS, thank you so much for your support and, and, and really being the driving force behind um, the, the inspiration to do a media focused conference at the time. Um, but I also wanted to thank, you know, Christian uh, for all the heavy lifting he did in the logistics. Uh, I, it would also be horrible if I did not acknowledge the important contribution that Hetan of Hibri made. Um, he's one of the moderator on the next panel, but he was really uh, central to helping formulate uh, and structure this conference. I mean, if I didn't thank him, it would, this would almost be plagiarism uh, to move on with this conference. So I want to thank you so much, Hatem. And I know that Hatem's interested in putting together a collected volume of some sort, and we'll be reaching out to the speakers um, about that. So as the session goes on, you see what the emerging themes are. 
uh, and you derive some sort of inspiration for really rethinking, um, you know, the media in, in the context of the region, especially when it comes to sort of politics, culture, society. Um, I think Hayatim gets all the credit for that, really. But we can also blame him if there's any omissions or any problems. So that's always the, the downside when it comes to getting credit. Um, but just, just to uh, tell you a little bit more about the conference, when, when Hatem and I were meeting about two years ago in a, in a coffee shop to talk about uh, where, what we wanted to do with this conference, we wanted to um, really bring together who we, people who we thought were the leading researchers doing really cutting edge and inter interesting stuff on sort of uh, media from a theoretical, theoretically grounded sort of perspective um, rather than strictly policy. Uh, which is so predominant in, in the way that in Washington, D.C., we talk about media and politics, especially of the region. Um, and we also looked for people who had uh, a rich familiarity and knowledge of the region rather than just strictly doing research uh, from afar. And so what we brought together, this slate of speakers is really a special, is really a special group. Um, but of course, you, what you'll see um, is, is that not only are we pushing forward, you know, how do we think about uh, regionality or the region itself in media terms, um, but how do we do from a bigger perspective rather than just sort of thinking about what are the hot issues of the day? And so you'll see that we don't have a lot of very specific or very narrow focus on social media or digital politics, for example, even though that's a really a, a strong research paradigm and something that's, that's attracting so much attention. So we're hoping with this conference to really step back and look at some of the larger questions that have sustained through time, but at the same time attending to uh, new perspectives and new kinds of questions uh, that some of these exciting researchers are raising. Um, so that's all I really wanted to say to sort of position you, just to repeat some of the things Professor Atia said. Uh, when you want to, if you're if you're just an attendee and you want to participate, uh, use the Q and A box to to ask your questions. I don't know if everyone's you know as familiar with Zoom as uh, you know we expect. I'm certainly new to Zoom, so I might be making some mistakes. Um, and then uh, how I plan to structure the session and each moderator will sort of structure it on their own is this. Um, I'm presuming everyone watched the presentations. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is sort of respond to individuals and then, and then let the individual re reply as opposed to just throwing it all out there and letting you speak. Uh, and then at that point, I'll start to ask maybe common questions of all the speakers and hopefully facilitate some sort of back and forth. So I invite our, our presenters to really speak to each other. And then after that point, we'll be opening it up to questions uh, from the attendees. I'll basically be re reading the questions that you've submitted. So I hope that makes sense. Okay, so let's get the show on the road with the first panel. Um, I, uh, I would like to present very quickly who our, who our speakers are. Uh, the bios are all on the website. So if you want the whole thing, you know, I, I invite you to open it up uh, and take a look at their bios. Um, we have uh, Omar Ghazi from uh, LSE, joining us in from London. Nargis Bajogli, who is here in DC at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. And Aydal Skandar, who's on the West Coast of Canada. There is a West Coast of Canada. I didn't know that. Uh, at Simon Fraser University. So thank you uh, all for being here. Uh, yeah, so what I want to do is just respond a little bit to each of you and then give you a chance to each respond before moving on to the next. Uh, I want to start with Amara because I think Amara provides a really big picture of the state of research and it really makes for a nice sort of introductory um, shot, I guess you could say, uh, into the, the purpose of the conference. So in Amara's presentation, he does all this hard work for us, just going through and, and, and listing in a way the dominant research paradigms, and the dominant research foci uh, of Western scholarship on Middle East media and politics. Um, and then he invites us, provokes us to look at these through the lens of temporality. Um, what I liked about your presentation is you did a lot of leading us to the water, with, but without giving us the water itself. Uh, and so we were left to really form our own conclusions about what temporality could do within this larger body of work. And you really problematized the sort of gap between outside researchers and uh, what, what are the discussions going on in the region itself. And I think that that's such a key point um, 
what I would like to know more about is how is temporality a way to, to cross that, that sort of bridge? Is it something that researchers from afar can attend to better in order to cross that bridge? And the reason why is because, you know, time, I know you're not talking about time in this way, but time is always related to distance. And so as a researcher living in Washington, DC, who might be researching the region, uh, I can only sort of drop in at different moments, depending on where my research is and depending on what's going on in my life. And so even I wrote a book in 2017 um, about an institution, Al Jazeera, my knowledge is sort of frozen in time. You know, the, the, I'm, I'm, temporality becomes implicated therefore in the methodology and the research itself because of the distance. Um, so even if I'm paying attention to things online, I'm not really, really there. And so I think, I think there's a question to be asked about is temporality, does, does it tell us something about, or does it, should it make us self-reflect on our positionality in the world vis-a-vis -vis what we study? Um, that's one kind of question. Um, another thing I wanted to point out uh, that you don't, you don't draw this point explicitly, but temporality is also important to think about change. And maybe that's how we cross the gap. Because even if you think about Edward Said's critique of Orientalism, one of his critiques is that the notion of the Orient is as an unchanging place. It's all about these essences that don't evolve over time. And this is what's, these are why the thematic representation of the Orient is, has so many themes um, that seem, seem actually, you know, to sustain themselves and to generate more and more sort of like policy scholarship, um, policy, artistic representations and so on. And so are you just drawing us back to Edward Said's critique to say, uh, we have to, temporality is, is a way to like really pay more attention to change and to be, to understand change, you have to have more proximity. I think, I think actually Nargis' uh, presentation does a good job of showing, and Adler's as well, showing how there is change even within dominant structures, whether it's like going from uh, pure like authoritarian media making to more commercialistic media making as in the case of the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guards media or as in this larger condition I do talks about going from authoritarianism, authoritarianism, pure authoritarianism to sort of authoritarianism with a neoliberal bent. I mean both those are attentive to change. So are we just are we just talking about being more attentive to change? Um, the other thing I wanted to point out was uh, how much, uh, you know, how much of your push to temporality requires us to think about like technological affordances of media itself, um, going just from like linear broadcasting, where there's a lot more political power over time because the broadcasters control the time slots. I just wanted to bring out one little artifact here. This this is a three quarter inch uh, tape. I have a massive collection of these now, and this thing is 16 or 30 minutes long. And how much power goes into determining each minute of this tape? Uh, it, 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 it requires more decision-making. It requires more hierarchical decision-making versus social media where there's no sort of built-in constraints on time. Um, so are you, are you trying to direct us to go from the big down to the micro of the actual technological forward and itself is sort of another uh, reaction I had. But I, I do think that I do like just thinking about temporality more and more, even when it comes to some things that you didn't mention, like for example, media and death and represent, representations of death, because death is the ultimate temporality because it's the absence of temporality. And the way that media representation or media work can cause people to get killed or media representations of people dying. Um, I, I feel like there's a lot of work on, on journalism and death. And you mentioned that the cultural studies uh, research on, uh, journalism is, is lacking, but I think, I don't know, I think that maybe a little more, I would be interested in hearing your thoughts about whether temporality can do more to sustain um, the cultural studies focus. Anyways, the last thing I wanted to say that I really liked about your presentation was that, um, you know, you're pushing, you're, you, you, you are really giving a space for the local everydayness of media experiences. You're pushing us to focus more on youth and age uh, as a factor, both of which are inherently connected to time. Um, not just to think uh, uh, about uh, media from a state, from a status, status perspective, centering the state, uh, which Nautilus and Agile uh, both do, which is obviously important, but we sort of need a little bit of everything uh, to really enrich our, our understanding and our knowledge.
Um, so that's all I wanted to say for Omar. Um, and then just feel free to respond to whatever you want to, and then I'll move on to responding to the other speakers. Um, yes, uh, first of all, um, I'm, I'm glad to be here and thank you very much for inviting me and for um, organizing um, you know, this, this conference. And uh, with your comments now, it just kind of uh, does what I was hoping it does is to kind of start a conversation and, and have a discussion on uh, the state of the field in a way and to think about how to locate our, our different scholarship uh, within it. Um, and, and so thank you for kind of engaging with the presentation at such an in-depth uh, way. So uh, a lot of, uh, I feel like now people will watch the presentation and be disappointed because you, you hyped it up. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, um, I like your comment on like the, uh, the notion of change. And I think that is, that is part of um, what I'm doing. My, my interest in temporality um, I think is because the temporal has um, kind of been within um, the Middle Eastern studies for a for a very long time, um, and like now we can see scholarship kind of um, like let's say with uh, Hatem for instance, and like the idea of um, the spatial turn in in Middle Eastern studies, like the I, there is there is this notion that that temporality has been a, a dominant lens um, to understand the region and and this is um intrinsic as well to post-colonial studies more generally where the ex the political experience of time of development um, of modernity is very dominant um so um even though this is true i think um like there is a kind of a need to kind of th theorize temporality beyond let's say beyond the dominant ways that it has been um, discussed in the academy, for instance, like collective memory studies, which offers only a, a partial way to understand the temporal, um, as well as like the, uh, the post-colonial approach, which this political moment, I think requires really like uh, revisiting uh, that scholarship and, and thinking about how we can um, think of the post-colonial condition under um, the neoliberal authoritarianism to kind of uh, use the term that, that Adil was using to think of the position of the nation state in the in the uh, Middle East region um, as well um, after um, because that that uh, kind of uh, lens of, of thinking of the nation state was also uh, has has also like moved on now in terms of like uh, Kind of the its position in relation to to the region um, as a whole. So that is why I'm I was really interested in the in the notion of the of the temporal. And I think what media studies can can offer that discussion, which which often seems like almost at a, at a dead end, is to think of is, is to think of the micro in a way. Think of uh, processes of of communication and how they interact with um, with technology. Uh, technological affordances with the with the notion of the of the local um, with uh, kind of that that goes beyond um, perhaps the the general frames of other fields um, that may focus on uh, may kind of focus on on the national or or the regional but not in a way that is directly linked to how uh, how people are are living their lives, how how their political um, positionality and subjectivity is is changing as well. So so that is perhaps um, the the argument that that I'm making is is the value of um, a media studies approach to thinking of the thinking of the temporal, the political and social experience um, of time. And of course, I I realize this is kind of um, perhaps like an, an ambitious or a broad take on it, but, um, but I think there, there is value in also, um, like e even though they're, they're like we, we lose some of perhaps the nuance when we talk about broad terms and uh, talk about like temporality or scholarship in, in broad terms, but there's also a value for, for doing that and taking a step back and, and thinking about 
and thinking about like where how to locate ourselves now within within this uh, history of studying the Middle East to to actually um, reflect on what questions have remained with us uh, for let's say four decades or and what questions have been reformulated. So I'll I'll stop here and maybe we can um, kind of revisit some of some of the threads. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to respond to, I think, uh, let's go with Adil because I, I think that it sets up uh, the comments to uh, Nargis. Um, my, my comments aren't going to be as extensive uh, as they were in re response to um, Amaris. Um, but I'm just, you know, the, the phrase that you pose, uh, neoliberal authoritarianism, to me, uh, is such an interesting one and an important one because of, of how... Uh, I guess contradictory the two terms tend to be, right? Neoliberalism as a, an economic or political economic order that is usually about the expansion of, of forces outside of the state, market forces, the private sector, and um, the impact that that has on our, all the way down to daily life. Uh, so it's the restructuring of the economy in relationship to politics. Um, I guess I guess it does make sense. I mean, that's exactly what you're saying is happening: is that authoritarianism is is it accommodating those forces, um, but creating almost like a new sort of hybrid uh, relationship between the two. And that this is a new condition that you're talking about. Um, what I what I want to understand is is how you think about uh, oppression and resistance to oppression. Um, do we? Is this just simply like oligarchs having more power, uh, non-state or state attached sort of oligarch, oligarchs having more power, or are there more cracks in the system that can therefore be better exploited by agents of resistance, independent media practitioners, advocates, activists, um, or is this just a more sophisticated matrix of control that actually ends up being more repressive uh, because so many maybe lines are blurred. So I'm just gonna kind of hearing your conception of, of oppression and resistance within this new condition. Thank you so much, Will. Um, and first and foremost, I wanted to reiterate what Amr said. It's a real pleasure to be here and thank you all for your uh, presence. Um, I, I would also, I mean, Will, you, you pointed out something that's quite intriguing in that the, the seeming contradiction or the, and the juxtaposition between the two terms, neoliberal and authoritarian, um, is, is only difficult to kind of comprehend and interpret, be, largely because we think of neoliberalism through the lens of American free market deregulation. Uh, but in, in most instances, neoliberalism manifests in a new configuration of control. So the more we think about how the market uh, forces operate uh, and and the and what market forces privilege at the expense of others, in many instances, deprivileging and delegitimizing and deprioritizing um, uh, sort of um, opportunities for social justice, opportunities for uh, embodiment through action, uh, we begin to realize that there is actually a very intimate relationship between neoliberalism and authoritarianism. That the two sort of complement each other in interesting ways. But because we are we've grown accustomed to, particularly in, in the sort of American uh, or Americentric kind of academy to think of uh, um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 these two sort of um, this Janus face where uh, you either accept um, authoritarian kind of media systems or you follow kind of like the Freedom House approaches to uh, liberalizing the media sector and privatization. And that is supposed to uh, produce deliverance, uh, deliverance in the form of extensive diversification of content, uh, uh, widening the, the frame, uh, introducing new tropes, uh, which is the argument that you often hear within the FCC, you know, the, 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 that sort of deliberation over what does it mean to widen the, 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 the framework or expanding the, um, the net, if you will. Um, but in most other manifestations of that discussion, uh, we, we actually note that uh, neoliberalism does precisely the opposite. Uh, it creates new conceptual and structural frameworks, as well as discursive and narrative um, 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 expressions that reinforce, in many instances, reinforce a very hierarchical structure. Uh, 
and um, and what is exist what, what I think is developing now in uh, a large part of the region uh, um, in, a, in, a, in an expansive sense is the incredible marriage between the two. Um, whether it's, and I, I've benefited tremendously from Bilgi's work, who I think Bilgi is speaking tomorrow. Uh, she she actually used that term in, in the title or the subtitle of her book, as well as um, Nihat also will speak about this a little bit later today. But they also are, are describing a Turkish sort of, um, um, representation of that model. So what I'm trying to describe here is, is that while the Turkish approach is the movement from a seemingly sort of more open-ended free market, if you will, uh, and highly privatized media sector towards more sort of authoritarianism. Uh, so the tentacles of the AK party begins to uh, consolidate control over those various aspects of the of the media landscape. But alternatively, we also have the examples similar to Egypt and many countries in the Gulf where you have the uh, so-called outsourcing of state broadcasting or state media production that is otherwise very entrenched and very controlled into a realm or a space that I think is that kind of middle ground. Uh, it's almost like a, a, a no, human, no person's land where it appears as though there's no real sort of consolidated structural hierarchical control, but in essence, both discursively, if you do the, the work of semiotic discursive analysis of content, which is what uh, um, Bilgi does in her, in, her, uh, in her research on AK Party's media content, or you look at it structurally, in the way that Nihat does as well, you begin to see how those two are kind of married to each other and they complement each other in incredible ways and produce in remarkable resilience uh, that, has, uh, that has the opportunity to outlive uh, what is otherwise a very easy to critique authoritarian uh, political system as it manifests in the media or a free market economic one that can easily be targeted on the in the argument that it mass produces consumerism and commodification of life. So that marriage between the two, I think, is, is much more muscular and has greater longevity and is not as easy to critique and disentangle. Uh, and that's why I find it particularly intriguing. But I also want to move away from assuming or treating um, this as a model. The modeling of, of media systems is deeply problematic structurally because it, it looks for ways to kind of um, assume that they are replicable and can be mimicked and, and, and we begin to also further essentialize those systems and they become resistant to change and ossify precisely what you described, but they are in constant transformative revision. Then how is this a regional phenomenon? Okay, if it's think, not a model, yeah. it's a condition. Yeah. What, what's, what's regional about it? I suppose that what is regional about it is, is potentially the commonalities that exist across the region by way of um, um, sort of uh, governments kind of learning from each other as to what works and what doesn't. So you and, and also the, the tendency to uh, to recognize the importance of consolidating control uh, and also the longevity of, of governance by way of political actors trying to stay in power for as long as possible, but also the move towards um, at least performing democratic revi revisionism in the post sort of Arab uprising period. So I think there's there's definitely, I mean, as we've talked about, and many of our colleagues here have looked at um, protest movements, you know, Marwan's work on on um, on dissidents and, and how, you know, uh, communities learn how to uh, utilize uh, protestation. Uh, governments in the region are also sort of learning and, and begin to explore different ways to outsource their media so that they're not as easy targets of criticism when a media system either fails or doesn't deliver or is um, or is uh, is clearly in the wrong. You know, so uh, the uprisings reveal to us that state media systems uh, either don't work or they don't have the ability to consolidate popular support uh, or substantial audience ship. But if you were to create what appears to be a firewall, this is sort of the, the Al Jazeera approach to things. And we know that uh, and you're sort of a scholar of Al Jazeera and you've followed how Al Jazeera is done. So Al Jazeera's success beyond many of its other sort of accomplishments is being able to create that kind of firewall between state and broadcaster, at least in terms of public perception. And I think a lot of state media operations are doing precisely that. So we're starting to see government allies uh, taking control of media so as to appear to be 
private broadcast and media entities producing content that is seemingly apolitical, but in reality at a very um, discursive level, reaffirm the status quo, but also reproduce neoliberalism in the manner that the state chooses. And of course, in some cases that neoliberal authoritarianism can be in, in contrast and in contestation with other manifestations of neoliberal authoritarianism. So the one that exists in Egypt is at odds with the similar manifestation that exists in Turkey. So there might be kind of an Islamist populist uh, version of that sort of uh, condition in Turkey, but then there's the hardcore sort of seemingly secularist, but I think that term doesn't quite fit, militarized uh, and hyper-nationalist jingoistic version of that in Egypt. And the two produce and reproduce uh, both um, uh, means of, of popular uh, consolidation, but also antagonism uh, towards one another. So there is no, but when I, when I choose to describe it as, not as a model, but rather a condition, it's to move away from trying to ossify it and say, this is what it looks like now, and this is what it'll look like indefinitely, and it should be replicable everywhere else. But by calling it a condition, we can imagine, well, now we use the word variance to describe things, but you can have like variants of things uh, manifesting in different places. Yeah, That's very, well, very well put, thank you. Uh, so Nargis, I, uh, I, well, first of all, I wanted to uh, tell everyone or remind everyone if you haven't read Nargis' uh, book, 2019 book, it's uh, Iran, Iran Reframed. Um, and this uh, presentation she gave is sort of an updating or an extension of it. Uh, and so that was very useful to those of us familiar with the book. Uh, I, want, I wanted to add two questions for you. So the first, I'll, I'll just ask the first one and let you respond. But uh, given what you've updated, what, what kind of has surprised you the most? I mean, did you see, was there a clear trajectory or was there any sort of sudden changes or anything that really surprised you? Um, because you you kind of did a lot of descriptive work, uh, but I didn't I didn't I would like to hear a little more what you have to say about you know whether anything sort of came out of left field. I mean, you talk about COVID and streaming. Is that is that the surprise there, or is there no surprise? Sure. First of all, hi everyone. Um, it's really wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I. Uh, for those who I know are in the webinar format I'm, and are in a part of the conference, um, I wish I could see all of you. It's um, I've been reading everyone's work for so long and also many of you I'm good friends with. So I wish we could be together in a, in a real setting, but it's wonderful to be here uh, virtually nonetheless. And thanks so much, um, Will, for putting all of this together and, um, and keeping it going despite all the setbacks. Um, so, okay, my, um, yeah, my presentation really was trying to, I, when I first was putting together last year for the conference that was happening, it was much more along the lines of, of the research I had done for the book, but honestly, by this point, I'm so, um, I'm so uh, tired of the book that I wanted to do, uh, talk about something a little bit different and a little bit more updated. So I haven't had a chance to really think through the fully the analytical sort of uh, approach that I'm taking to this, but there are, there are surprises that I'm seeing here. Part of it though, I think goes back to what Adel was just talking about, which is this neoliberal authoritarianism um, that, that is very much be, taking place in uh, Iran. And that juxtaposed with one of the big differences that has happened since I did my research and wrote my book is the maximum pressure campaign from the Trump administration, and in essence, the the type of uh, warlike stance between Iran, Israel, the United States, and kind of on the side Saudi Arabia. And so, what this is doing is it's creating new kinds of uh, ways of um, representation and new ways of needing to justify uh, politics and policies, and don't go towards protest against us because we are in this existential crisis. And so what before in the past few decades within Iran, what the state and especially those involved within the military and paramilitary media establishments had been working on is very much this top down form of media production, which could very well be described as and they themselves would describe it as propaganda. But they've been moving away from that because they understand that it doesn't work, it doesn't have the audience shares that they need it to have. 
And so in my book, I, I talk about some of these different strategies that they develop, but what really begins to shift quite uh, quickly um, is uh, the, the shift towards very much this Hollywoodization of Iranian state military media and that they are very closely now, and this is a big shift that they themselves are talking about, moving away from what I described in the presentation as studying Soviet media as a way of doing revolutionary media to now very, very closely studying American Hollywood war films, basically taking on the Hollywood model and creating very entertaining media for internal audiences and external ones. Although what I'm focusing on mostly is what's going on internally. Um, so, um, and what I think another big shift in all of this is that they're, they're quite successful. I mean, even though folks uh, audiences would always turn away from what was on state television. They would seek out alternative forms of media. They would look for Iranian art house or independent filmmakers to look into. Right now with the streaming services, as well as even on national state television, these new types of uh, television series that are coming out, they are so incredibly entertaining and slickly produced in this Hollywood style that it is drawing huge audience shares. And so that is creating a new form of discourse within Iran about, uh, the, about the state and the military establishments vis-a-vis -vis all of the political and geopolitical things that are going on in the region. So it is a big shift in the sense that um, it is creating a larger audience share than anything that they've done in the past few decades. Now, does that actually mean audience buy into the messages? Obviously, we can't necessarily conclude that. Um, and, and it's much more complex than any of that. But nonetheless, there is a shift that is happening here that is, and, and they see it themselves in a very positive light. They're, they think they're being extremely successful because they see the audience share numbers that are coming in, their rating numbers that are coming in. And again, interestingly, not just within Iran, but among the diaspora too, which has a very antagonistic relationship to the state in Iran. Yet nonetheless, because these shows are so incredibly uh, entertaining, it's it's creating audience share outside of the country as well um, among the diaspora. So there are shifts here and I think it's going to, um, there is something important happening. I just can't yet tell you what that is in a nutshell. Yeah, you, you made it very clear that you were interested in uh, the, the sort of uh, domestic or the, the national context. Um, but you know, you did, as you mentioned just now, you talked about the move from the, the sort of Soviet propaganda to a more, uh, I guess, American style, highly commercialized propaganda with a little more finesse, I guess you could say. And you did just mention also that it's circulating within diaspora. Uh, also, one thing you mentioned in your presentation was about Iranian art house cinema, which certainly has a global audience and is very influential. And so I'm, I'm just wondering, um, do we, do you, at the same time, you did mention uh, the Aydin's framework uh, or condition sort of seems applicable um, and, and Bill Gies as well, we should acknowledge her uh, contribution uh, is applicable there. So I guess the point that I'm getting at is, uh, do you understand Iran more like a global context or a transnational context outside of the region or um, what, what, the, what, what benefit is it of it to think of it regionally? Is there a case to be made for maybe it not mattering, not, not being so regional, um, regionally connected. I'm interested to hear what you have to say. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, the, the reason I was talking about it regionally and nationally is because these stories in particular that the military, the Revolutionary Guard are producing are meant for a domestic audience. The storylines will not translate to outside of because it's so mirrored into the details of what's going on that it, it doesn't really make sense for outside audiences. These particular productions, now that do, they, do, they do other kinds of productions that are meant, for example, for uh, Iraqi, Syrian, Lebanese um, communities, uh, especially Shia communities. Uh, they do also have a, a fairly vast uh, network into Latin America and do uh, productions in Spanish, especially for Venezuela and Cuba. So they are, th this pr these particular groups are involved in trans creating media 
from their perspective that is transnational and regional in capacity. But the ones that I'm seeing and that I've been observing that are making the shift that I'm talking about, they're doing it specifically for domestic audiences. Now they are learning from transnational, regional, and sort of global trends in, in, in art and media production in general. And I think actually it goes towards um, some of what Adel and Bill Gay and others are talking about with this neoliberal authoritarianism as far and specifically the ways in which media is utilized to, um, to uh, move forward a particular kind of politics. Uh, these, and then the, the reason I'm focusing so much on the region is because this, the, this type of media that I'm focusing on is consistently responding to uh, regional military and political developments. So, so they are the ones who are uh, who are trying to to forge certain realities in response to the different kinds of pressures that they see themselves under. Now, at the same time, though, um, they are constantly, and I talk about this a lot in my book, up against the cosmopolitan um, uh, sort of um, the cosmopolitan. Uh, cultural capital that the independent artists in Iran have in, on a global sense, and also the ways in which they're looked down upon on a global sense from outside. Um, and so they are attempting very much, and I see this shift towards Hollywood as their attempt to become more global um, in, in their aesthetics and to not be so, when you look at it, you can tell, oh, okay, this is a, a state production in Iran in for Shia martyrology, for, you know, uh, citizens have to be like Imam Hussein. They're moving away completely from all of that and actually creating an aesthetic that is much more global in style. Um, so they're trying to, I think, slowly move towards that. It's funny that you mentioned uh, aesthetics because, you know, Adel in his presentation, he mentioned there's a particular aesthetics that comes out of this. Um, so that would be that would be sort of the question that I would uh, pose to all the panelists. The first question would be about uh, the aesthetic dimension of, of kind of what you're presenting, or to put it another way, can we speak of there being a new aesthetics, or are we see, are we just seeing um, sort of the old iconography repurposed, regenerated, repackaged, or retold, or is there a, a brand new sort of grammar of aesthetics that's coming out of the changing condition, or some of the developments that we're, we're talking about? Uh, for Amar, they might, might be talking about youth. Um, younger generations. I'd be interested in, in, in hearing what you have to say about the aesthetics. Any, anyone who wants to go, just jump in. Yeah, like I, I think, um, like I think it is really important, um, like for us as as scholars, to kind of um, perhaps because I think uh, if we reflect also on our positionality, particularly as you know, Western-based scholars talking about the, the Middle East, I think there's a tendency to speak and like to talk about, let's say the region as a whole, or like the, the Arab media system or Middle Eastern, you know, uh, form of authoritarianism. But I think like when, when we apply like the, the temporal and think about the passage of time, like there is, if, if you think about um, even, let's say the past, uh, the past 10 years, Probably we all cannot believe that it's been 10 years since the Arab uprising. Like that, you know, how um, even the, the Arab uprisings, which were uh, such a historic event for, for us, you know, for um, when, when it happened, it was, it was unthinkable. Now we're, we're having to deal with it as, as part of history in, in some sort, like the, the generation of people who participated in it are now having to, to think about it personally as, as well as in, in terms of, of um, scholarship as, as something in the, distant, in the distant past in terms of perhaps like through the lens of, um, of failure or trauma or like, the, and you know, this is something we're like, that is that people are still grappling with. with. But me meanwhile, it's not like time has stopped. Like there's a, a whole new generation that like young people in in the uh, in the Middle East who have like let's say if we if we talk about um, Syrians for instance there there are um, teenagers now who haven't known like uh, Syria as it was before who the idea of of warfare 
is um, the context of, of their lives. And so their, their relationship with, with um, let's say, the, the aesthetic um, of activism is changing. Um, and it's something that you know, we, we need to, as scholars, re-engage with to understand the effect of, of that temporal distance from, let's say, the Arab uprising. It doesn't mean that, that everything is new, of course. Like in, in my research um, about the Arab uprisings, I was precisely interested in what, uh, like the, what symbolism and tropes have remained uh, kind of uh, as, as uh, mobilizing aspects, as you know, inspiring people to go in the street. And, and there's always history matters and the way that it emerges when we least expect it, but the culture of of remembrance and and reformulation of meaning and um, so making and unmaking meaning um, in relation to to culture and history is constantly under change, and that is why like when when we bring in um, technology like even and that is something that in media studies I think more scholars are are aware of that there there is a tendency let's say we still talk about social media as if it's one thing. As if you know, like the the so as if Facebook um, has not changed in the past five years or ten years, and or the new social media platforms. So in in a way, like I think there there is importance in um, taking like the the present the presentness of media studies, which is which can also be the like a fault of or a shortcoming of media studies when it doesn't think about history with Middle East studies that is more uh, perhaps um, aware of the temporal to a fault where, you know, like a lot of, it, it is not kind of um, engaging with the region in, in a renew, with renewed energy. So to, to kind of bring those approaches to, together to have a, a, a more um, maybe like a, a faithful and, and like true kind of reflection of, of the fast changes that, that are happening, that, you know, our theorization of it and our understanding of its aesthetic is, is always kind of lagging behind. Is we're going in order, are we? <laughs> um, right. no, anyone else, yeah. Okay. Um, honestly, I feel I feel as though I I would much rather talk about Almar's uh, as like the work on his, the work that he does with with aesthetics. No, I can't. Sorry, right, stick to the question. Um, no, no, but I, I mean I think I think what what Omar does in his research outside of this is precisely the way aesthetics um, manifest to describe a theoretical kind of approach. I mean, your work, his work on Grindeiser, for instance, and the resuscitation of kind of nostalgia or neo-Ottoman cool. Um, I'm really like plugging in all your work on it, but, but honestly, like this is, this is precisely the way in which, um, you know, one can pan out and say, all right, this is, this is the aesthetics. This is how it operates. This is how the discourse and the, and the narratives manifest. And this is how we can begin to kind of theorize it in a more expansive way. When it comes to um, neoliberal authoritarianism, and, and Marwan poses a question here that I'm answering, but it was sent to the panel and not the attendees at large, so I'll, I'll get to that momentarily. But being able to kind of um, reverse the the order of that terminology, um, can should we call it, uh, you know, um, authoritarian neoliberalism? And I think a lot of it has to do with aesthetics, in addition to kind of structure, what we decide to foreground and what do we decide to background. Um, all of this has something to do with, with aesthetics. So in many instances, we assume that uh, aesthetics has more to do with um, granular decision-making on the part of those who are crafting messages. Um, and and our, our ability to presume and, and, uh, and bestow agency or at least perceive agency on the part of uh, discourse and narrative creators, whether they be journalists, reporters, um, you know, animators, however, wherever people sit within this really sort of expansive behemoth of, uh, of, of media um, enterprise, um, we assume that that's where aesthetics happens. And, and I think what I'm inviting us to, to contemplate is the possibility that perhaps aesthetics exists somewhere else, or at the very least, the, the progenitor. I mean, this is a term that I've 
been very attracted in using. It's a very sort of uh, biological term now that we're in the world of like viruses, like what is the progenitor of this idea? And in many instances, I think that we need to draw our attention back to uh, this sort of age old, you know, institution that we call the news agency, right? News agencies appear to have kind of disappeared into oblivion. They're, they've They've, uh, they're no longer relevant, but in essence, they are. They remain an important part of the organism that continues to produce and manufacture discourses and narratives that then permeate very much a lot of what uh, uh, what transpires in these media entities, whether they happen to be creative content uh, produced by uh, by artists on Netflix or it ends up being uh, reports from uh, pseudo state news, uh, news producers. So, I mean, the, the analysis of TRT is a great example of that. Uh, Nergis's work is, is a fantastic example of that on Iran, that basically aesthetics isn't entirely in the hands of content producers, but rather that there is mu a much more, I hate to put it in such um, um, sort of, um, uh, you know, perhaps overzealous terms, but it's almost a sinister way of doing things. Like there is a decision making that, that happens behind the scenes where like, okay, this is approved. In some cases, it's very vulgarized and where there are uh, boards and, and councils that approve or disprove creative projects. But there are other instances where uh, it is less, uh, less, less heavy handed and less top down. But nevertheless, it does permeate the aesthetics. And so aesthetics exists on those two planes and I think they intersect with each other. Yeah, I just wanted to ask Nautilus if you if you had a particular response to that or yeah, application of that to your what you've been studying. Yeah, so I think um, here actually, is there a new aesthetic? At least in the case that I study, and in general, I'm now also looking a lot more at the um, at the um, sort of evangelical right movement in the United States because they take Iran as as the, the the place of evil in the world. And so I'm really interested in how they also create that. So I've been paying a lot more attention and doing some research on their world for a new project that I'm working on. And I think there's something, so yes, the aesthetic is for folks who have a, these political agendas who are trying to get eyes on their on the screen or on their material the aesthetic is the dominant aesthetic of instagram of hollywood highly highly stylized highly polished and that oftentimes comes from having money you have to have a particular kind of budget behind the work that you do to produce this kind of polished sort of aesthetic now where does this become and i think lends into what Adil was talking about with um, authoritarian um, neoliberalism is that for example within the case of iran there has been so much money poured in from the the military establishment into their their young producers of a particular political background which is more on the conservative end and so they are now becoming the ones who are producing the cool aesthetic they're able to replicate the cool of the global aesthetic in a way that those who were from the resistance end, and this also goes back to your question I think that you were asking other before which is what happens to resistance when neoliberal uh, authoritarianism begins to have so much incredible power is that the the problem with it when we're thinking about it aesthetically and then also communicatively is that um, it becomes really hard to produce that kind of aesthetic without having the money necessary to create that kind of polished look and importantly to be able to push it out in that way to get screen to get eyes on the screen for it. And so what that begins to do is it shifts who's producing cool and who's producing new content. And that in the long term, I think is beginning to have, at least I see it in Iran, beginning to have influence um, and, and beginning to change dynamics. Um, so that for example, we, I, you can, I now look or can very easily tell when things are being produced by the res resistance movements in Iran or those who are trying to push for reform and it just doesn't catch your eye. And, and it, because it's just not as sharp as what this other side is producing. And I think that this has tremendous repercussions for our politics and the ways in which we think we, we should be thinking about politics and resistance and authoritarianism um, be, in, in this highly saturated media world.
Thank you for that. That's that's so interesting. Um, I mean, aesthetics are always an, a reflection or an expression of power. Uh, I want to turn to some questions that we received from the Q and A, uh, and of course, you know, um, if any of you have questions for each other, I also invite you to, to sort of jump in. Um, so the questions right now are directed towards individuals, and the first one is for Adam. Uh, can you elaborate on the political economy of the relationship between media corporations and the state in the case uh, the cases that you uh, are talking about? Are these corporations benefiting financially from the media activities, or is it more about large diversified conglomerates with some media operations forming alliances with the state to secure benefits in other non-media sectors? In other words, are their media activities a sort of service to the state or is there real money making happening uh, in these activities? And that question is from the Associate Director of IMS, uh, Dr. Shana Marshall. What an incredible question, honestly. Um, <laughs> You're stumped. <laughs> yeah, yeah there's, there, there's so much to say. And, and I think um, without taking too much of everybody's time, um, I think it's important to note that because I'm trying to pan out um, and, and do a little bit of a kind of a regional contrast and comparison, um, there, anything that I say might be somewhat sort of contradictory in, in another locale. So it depends largely on, on the lens that we choose to use in different kind of spaces and different uh, configurations of how power, state, media, and, and the corporate realm inter intersect and interact with each other. I would say that all of these conditions exist in one way, shape, or form within the condition that I'm describing. So all of the examples given about, um, you know, um, who wields the power, who gets to call the shots, uh, who's infringing on who, uh, the extent to which um, boards and councils uh, determine whether or not a news agency or a broadcast network exists or doesn't exist, the ratification of these uh, of these operations, uh, whether or not there is infringement on their day-to-day -day activities. So I think the the relational um, dimension between the so-called private sector, private media sector, uh, and the state is very nebulous because um, in many instances, but not all, uh, those two sort of bleed into each other. Uh, there is the instance that Nargis describes where you've got the effectively the uh, the military uh, establishment kind of outsourcing its uh, its media production with increased aesthetics to uh, a private kind of um, production entity or entities uh, and you and which is similar to what's happening in Egypt and you have other circumstances where uh, the private media entities are becoming more and more um, drawn into. Uh, the state operations with increased authoritarian interventions, such as the case of Turkey. And then you've got other countries like Libya and, you know, where there's a much more disparate kind of media landscape and those relationships are much more fraught and they depend largely on who's bankrolling and who's supporting them. Uh, the one condition, I think we have too many experts here, Will being one of them, uh, who can speak to uh, this point about whether or not there is kind of a uh, a, um, a financial financial regenerative aspect to this and whether or not the private sector media sector in the Middle East and North Africa at large uh, is actually profit generating that's a that's a real question and, and why uh, governments choose to do what they do um, the condition that I think has been uh, in place for much of the last 20 30 years and the work of Naomi Sucker, uh, and others draw attention to that more specifically is that most of the investment in media is happening largely for political influence and leverage at, as opposed to for uh, revenue and profit generation. Uh, so everybody has a horse in the race as opposed to trying to generate money from those bets. The bets are being hedged to uh, be able to navigate these political spaces and have influence influence being uh, public attention, pu public opinion, and, and in many instances, uh, as Chomsky and, and Herman would say, manufacturing consent uh, at large. Uh, so the issue of how much money is being made, and, and Marwan's done a lot of research on that with reality television, uh, there are few exceptions in that, in that regard, and perhaps uh, you know, uh, contractual agreements with Netflix and various other uh, major multinational corporations is going to draw attention to the possibility of that. But by and large, uh, a lot of this is political leverage and 
And in most instances, the people who are investing in the media sector are doing so to either complement, not for a financial return, but to complement politically uh, their, their involvement in other sectors, whether it's construction or, uh, or real estate or various other things. And we see that with examples in Turkey, uh, in Iran as well, in, in Egypt. Uh, and obviously in Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. So uh, it's not media, uh, the private media, the way we imagine them and think of them in the US and European context, at least not privately. The private is still part of the state in, in complicated ways. And that's what I'm trying to disentangle, but it's too, it's too messy, admittedly, even for, even for a lot of us who've been studying this for a while to, to try and describe in a holistic sense. But thank you, it's an amazing question. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Ahmad, and this is from Hatim. He says, uh, how might we include the question of mediated simultaneity, so mediated simultaneity, uh, as part of the question of temporality? And uh, maybe you also can explain mediated simultaneity for uh, non-specialists. Um. Yeah, like I, I understood that as, as like liveness. Is that, is that what you mean? It's, I think that uh, that's how I understood it. I feel like this is an example of me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, th I think, you know, this is a, this is a, a great question, which also kind of sh shows um, like in, not only in relation to aesthetics, but also in, in relation to the functionality of, of media and how how uh, p political uh, power and struggles have are now like adapting to new forms of media as well, um, and and with liveness it is like this this contrast between kind of the 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 abundance of time that can be spent producing media and consuming media versus like the the limits of um, of attention first of all but also the limits of what can be said so you've got like when we when we're speaking of um, authoritarian contexts in, in the middle east you you've got the technology that pushes you to share and to say and the simul like the in a very simultaneous live way and like the the powers that want you to not to do that so um sorry so yeah, like I, I think that is kind of uh, an example of, of, of how even, even to understand, let's say censorship, like I'm, I'm thinking for instance, recently in Egypt, uh, when, where there was like a live footage in a hospital when oxygen ran out in, a, in, a, in intensive care and how immediately like that footage was broadcast and, and immediately, you know, we knew, I knew that like this poor guy, you know, like he's, like he's probably, and and I think he was um, arrested after after that. So like it's it's kind of like um, I think wh whether it comes to to users, to people, or to governments, there's a, a new formulation of um, what can be said and what cannot, and what leads to 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 what is is like a, a moving. Um, like a moving um, relationship in a in a in a way, um, TikTok is another example of like on the one hand you know like there is th there is this um, push to to kind of uh, to brand yourself to get followers, but we also see like the the manufacturing of the limitations of that on the go. Like no, you can't say this. No, this is. This, you can't dance this way or wear this thing. There are no rules that you know anyone understands in 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 terms of what to do or what not to do. But that's I feel I feel like even that relationship of um, kind of repression is, um, is is taking new forms. I think so. Um, so that that is precisely I think the kind of uh, like when when thinking about m media from a temporal perspective, it pushes us kind of uh, even understand like new logics of, um, of authoritarianism um, as well. Thank you. Uh, there's a quick follow up question for our, um, actually let me, let me, there's a question here for Nargis I wanted to get to. Um, uh, 
there's two questions and I'll kind of put them together uh, if you're not a guess. One is actually a question from Moises uh, Garduno from the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Uh, he asks if there's any form to measure the success or not of this new media strategy made by Pastaran and Jose Honari. I'm sorry for the mispronunciation. And then, um, did you get that question? Okay, and then yeah. Yasmin uh, asked if, uh, you know, since Iranian independent cinema partakes in a globalized art house aesthetic that is also polished in ways different than Hollywood producers, do you see regime cultural producers drawing as well on this art house aesthetic as another foray into cosmopolitanism? Sure, so thank you for those two great questions. So for Moises, um, as far as uh, forms of measurement, so they're um, within the, yeah, they do measure themselves, uh, audience shares and things like that. However, what I found when I was doing my ethnographic research is that those, um, when I was trying to uh, determine the success or not of their, of these different strategies that they were producing, much of it sort of comes about and they can tell when there are big public events that happen. So for example, there was a few years ago, um, the returning of 175 dead soldiers, Iranian soldiers from that who had been buried in Iraq. It was a huge production in Iran and a lot of people, especially younger people who very much uh, did not look like they were pro-regime supporters and I was doing interviews with them and they very much were not, but they were in these public um, uh, commemorations because of the ways in which these media strategies from the Revolutionary Guard had rebranded themselves as these national, um, as a nationalist force rather than as a force for the, the defense of the political system. You can see the same thing again with the uh, funeral for Qasem Soleimani it just produced millions and, and I know folks who disagree with the government say that no those people were you know made to come out I've participated in my research and a lot of public programs that they've done there's no and they're most successful they are, they have never been able to produce numbers like that that was that was organic and so for them that was very much a success of the media very specific media strategies they created around Qasem Soleimani and then also the Revolutionary Guard writ large however because of the downing of the airliner passenger airliner on the day that they were responding to the U to the US in the US airbase uh, in Iraq and that passenger airliner came down, they hit it uh, by mistake and then they lied about it for a few days. That basically cut uh, the, all of these years of media strategy that they had been doing and created huge amounts of anger and pain in the population. And so they're now have, they've been trying to rebuild. And that's why in the early phase of Corona, actually the Revolutionary Guard took a huge step into the background uh, domestically. And it was the formal military that came out to do Corona relief and things like that. And they're slowly beginning to rebuild a new kind of narrative around who they are now because they need to, because that, that narrative no longer works. So again, this is another thing where it sort of shows going back to Omar's point about temporality, these things can change super quickly as well in this new kind of media environment that we are in, as well as in, in all of the, the, the tremendous amounts of political back and forth that's happening um, in particular and within Iran and, and across the region. Now for Yasmin's question, um, uh, so yes, there, there definitely are uh, folks within, and again, I'm in, in our session today, I'm using, I'm being kind of careless in the way that I talk about some of this stuff because I'm sort of making it all seem very monolithic. There's a lot, there are so many divisions within these or within the Revolutionary Guard media producers. They disagree with one another about right, the right strategies they should be taking in. So what I'm talking about the Hollywood aesthetic, it is one, one part of this world, but it is now a part that has a ton of money and they're investing it in media production. There is another sector within, within these, uh, Revolutionary Guard media producers who, yes, try to do what you outlined, which is, you know, uh, emulating the aesthetics of Iranian art house cinema in order to try to get into international film festivals and things like that. And they're the ones who actually, they care about the aesthetics of their films. They're, they're trying to be, you know, they're trying to partake in, in the circulation of film. However, um, art house cinema, even the most successful ones in Iran, 
besides like separation, you know, besides things like that, they don't garner a huge audience share. Uh, most of Kyoto Stani's films, I mean, beyond a certain beyond a certain sector of the population, a lot of these art house films in Iran would be in the cinemas for two weeks, and then that was it, and then they would go on to the international circuits because they're not necessarily entertaining films; they're beautiful art films, but they're, it's not something that everyone is going to go and watch. And so the the folks that I'm talking about today, their drive to making media is slightly different. They they want audience share. They want people to be entertained. And then you have other folks within this media uh, military establishment who, yes, care about the aesthetics of filmmaking. And yes, they are sort of emulating those art house films. So again, I, I'm, I'm using a lot of shorthand uh, in today, but, uh, but there is a lot of um, complexity in all of this. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Amar from uh, Nikki Akhavan, who's presenting uh, tomorrow. Uh, do you have any comments about Arab futurism as a new way of reading contemporary moments through the lens of the future and challenging how temporality has been handled in discourses within and about the region? To me, this seems like an exciting direction with potential to disrupt some of the ways the past and present of West Asia and North Africa uh, has been conceptualized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you that, that this is kind of an exciting, uh, an exciting, um, Kind of a frame to to think about the region, and I think it it like there are um, a number of of younger scholars engaging with this. Um, I'm I'm happy to share that I actually just received a grant to uh, for a project called Arab News Futures. So watch uh, this space. Um, like <laughs> I'm I'm interested particularly in in thinking about like the the question of the um, the Arab audience. You know, of course, you know. Uh, that has been um, discussed also by by uh, Marwan, that, but like the idea of how it is also conceived in the in the future, um, like how journalists and editors now conceive of a new Arab audience and and kind of thinking about futurity as as a productive way to to think of um, like Arab news audiences and news technologies. So I and I think there is even. A work that is also look his, historicizing futurity. So it's not only contemporary work, but there's um, like I I know of a number of uh, young scholars who are thinking about these questions, like th theorizing now like his, historical moments of um, imagination of the future. Um, so yeah, I think that is that is um, kind of an exciting um, route for for Middle East studies. Um, I, I, I wanted to ask you just a quick follow up to that about uh, where do we find historic, like where are the most interesting places to find past articulations about uh, an Arab future? Um, yeah, like I think I think where where that debate is being had, like now there there are there's increasing interest, for instance, in historicizing the Arab left. Um, and a lot of a lot of that is about uh, kind of thinking um, thinking of um, like w how to make sense of their legacy. I'm thinking of, for instance, Fadi Bardawil um, has a new book about the Lebanese left, for instance, and and within like within uh, kind of I think uh, mostly historians are having are having this debate, particularly around um, the, the left, but also. But also political scientists and like in in Cambridge, there's um, I think there's going to be like this um, anthology of like the Arab left that that revisits this question, um, revisiting like the Enlightenment, for instance, Al Nahda. Also, like this is kind of mostly uh, historians who are who are doing this work, but like his, historicizing the futurity uh, as imagined in the 19th century, for instance. Um, but there are also like I don't know if you I, I recently, for instance, saw an article about um, like the the Lebanese uh, space program in the 1960s and and how like uh, they there were like all so that is you know like there were all these like uh, uh, students who were trying to to have like um, a space program for for Lebanon. Of course, that that didn't really go anywhere. But like it's. Uh, 
like it is these moments that that are now like kind of um, get attention from scholars that yeah like uh, engage with with the notion of um, futurity some of the dominant texts or some of the texts that come to mind for me are all the national plans that are put out by the states because those are always uh, you know fantasies of of the future but always from the perspective of sort of uh, neoliberal authoritarianism uh but yeah i there, there's a quick follow-up question actually uh, Prof, uh professor lasell hints um asked this of you specifically i want to anyone else can kind of chime in here um how do you evaluate attempts by uh, Saudi, UAE, and other actors to counter Turkey's neo-Ottoman cool, either in terms of their attempts to compete with Turkish media producers on aesthetics and or, and or identity messaging to Arab audiences or in terms of audience reception? So each of you could kind of respond to that within um, you know, your own interests. Anyone, did anyone want to speak to that? I want to go ahead if you... Um, yeah, like I think I think that is um, um, like that's it's a very interesting question, um, and I, like the way that I think about it, um, it, it is that we we have to think about it. I think in relation to uh, the availability of historic narratives and the, and their political use. So for for Turkey, the like the, the, its Ottoman history is is a very usable kind of uh, historical legacy that neatly. Uh, fits into its nation state in a way like you know Turkey was the the center of the of the Ottoman Empire in the in the Arab world it's a messier uh, historical terrain that sometimes is more like it is more difficult to kind of uh, use particularly if it is like it, it's easy to kind of uh, put forth something that um, is against, let's say, um, a positive interpretations or remembrance of the Ottoman Empire, but it's harder to come up with a historical narrative that inspires others. The, the anti-colonial has been, of course, a dominant one in Syria, for instance. Um, like a lot of a lot of the historic, um, most of the kind of historical dramas are focused on either the anti-colonial or, or anti-Ottoman period. With with the Gulf, it has centered on um, like Islam and Islamic figures, like the the caliphates. There's a lot of those productions, but then like there's it's a tension between you know like like that doesn't neatly uh, like kind of fit within the nation state because of course like when you talk about religion, you also are framing it in, in global terms rather in rather than nationalistic terms. Um, and like there, there is, for instance, one interesting example um, that's like a Saudi Egyptian production, Mamalik and Nair, from that talks about the Mamluk period, which which is it's interesting because it is not like um, like the Mamluk period is complicated and and it's not very usable to kind of uh, like uh, promote you know Saudi or or interests in in the region. So I think uh, kind of. Uh, it's not it's it's not like uh, the same terrain for every state in what history they can use. It's easier for some states than others. Thank you. Uh, Yasmin had an interesting question for uh, Adel. Uh, I'm going to slightly reframe it a little bit, um, but it's really she's asking about uh, making sense of sort of the, the micro practices of media workers and media producers. Uh, who are working, you know, for the state, the state outlets or these new sort of neoliberal, neoliberal authoritarian outlets. In other words, I think this is asking almost like a connection between the ethnography of work, of media work, um, with these larger structural changes. What would you kind of expect to see? Because I know you haven't gone into the field, right? Um, or what kind of questions would you ask if you were going to go into the field to look for where the rubber meets the road? Thank you, Yasmin, and thank you, um, Will, for posing this question. I think this is, this is um, in my opinion, an extremely vexing problem, and it's a theoretical problem that far predates the circumstances that we're describing here, That because we have, um, and it's not just theoretical, it's also, also methodological, as you were kind enough to, to specify, like, how would we execute this type of research? And, and although Yasmin is asking about how we might be able to con conceptualize it, um, I think the real problem is that um, we are um, at the outset often 
choosing which path we we want to take. We either want to look at uh, these institutions through the political economy of, of communication lens and try to understand systems of ownership and structure and and where the buck stops and how things are are performed uh, or we're choosing to do sort of either audience research or engaged in sort of the sociology of 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 work and, and perhaps even labor uh, and what that means and what that entails um, my you know my sort of thinking about this is that you know we are it's it's more productive and more generative if we were to leave our comfort zones uh, it would be great to have more political economists of communication uh, being concerned with uh, aesthetics and discourse and narrative and and relational sort of dynamics uh, in the quote unquote foot soldiers among the foot soldiers of these media um, entities and how pr the production actually works. Uh, and the converse is also true. The sort of the critical cultural studies uh, lens uh, could also benefit tremendously from thinking about the structural materiality of the way these institutions work. So I'm, you know, admittedly, I'm doing my own sort of uh, um, sort of self discovery by trying to do something that I probably haven't done before, which is to think about how um, neoliberalism manifests both as an aesthetic all the way up to sort of structural materiality and and how those two kind of work with each other um i imagine that uh the as, as yasmin described it like the micro ambitions or the micro aspirations uh of of employees or workers or uh, producers in many instances assuming a, some degree of agency uh, in what in what they do, uh, they believe that they have some control over the narrative, and in many instances they do. Uh, but uh, but at the same time, the levers are often um, moving things in in complicated and interesting ways. And all of us know of one or more media entities where this happens in very very precise ways. Uh, your work on Al Jazeera, various other people who have done precisely that. Uh, Nargis's um, description of the incredible sort of nuances, even in terms of how aesthetics are deployed and weaponized, uh, is an indication of the incredible diversity within these entities. So I want to make sure that no that um, anybody listening to this is not uh, assuming that I'm trying to use a broad brushstroke to say, all right, everything falls under this umbrella. It makes sense. It's a perfectly coherent and cohesive and contiguous argument. It, it, it is not. It's extremely messy and very untidy. And I'm uh, as puzzled by this paradox uh, as, as you, Yasmin. If you have an answer, I'd love to, to hear it. But I'm still sort of grappling with those details of how to think through the, the superstructure in uh, intrinsic ways. But ethnography, I mean, from my own sort of um, inclination, ethnography is usually the right answer. You know, get in there, get your, you know, get your hands dirty and try to understand how this is, uh, this is happening. Uh, but at the same time, that foregoes the opportunity to look at what is happening behind the scenes. And what is behind the scenes is sometimes inaccessible. And so we have to come up with, um, you know, um, uh, our best, you know, estimate or guess as to uh, why decisions are made behind closed doors and where those closed doors are and who's sitting at those at, at those tables. But thank you, Yasmin, really appreciate that. It, it reminds me of something an interview he told me once, uh, an, you know, a veteran journalist with uh, Al Jazeera who said, we used to know what the red lines were, uh, but now we don't know what the red lines were or are, they're kind of invisible, they're shifting, but like the consequences can be very similar. Uh, I want to do, uh, leave the final question here for uh, Nargis. Uh, this is a question from Alex Gray. How has COVID changed the finances of Iran's cinema industry and is it consolidating? For instance, we've seen popular actors and directors work with producers like Auj. Um, so thanks for that question, Alex. Uh, it's not COVID that's affecting the finances, it's the sanctions uh, because Places like Oj, uh, which for those who may not know, it's a, uh, it's like one of the things I was talking about in my um, presentation video um, recorded presentation, which is one of the private uh, production homes gets a ton of money from the IRGC that is really helping to push this sort of Hollywood aesthetic that I was mentioning. 
Um, and yes, it created a whole, uh, just to give folks a really like one minute background, it created a lot of controversy in Iran because uh, the, the art house sector, especially the directors and writers and, and um, actors from that world were really, have been really angry about the neoliberalization of Iran's cinema industry. Uh, because uh, prior to this, uh, the state provided a lot of funding, which meant that uh, these art house films could be produced uh, and it did not rely upon how much money they made or did not make. And now with the neoliberalization of the media sector in Iran, uh, there's different considerations in mind. And it's sort of like, a lot of people are talking about, um, you know, one of the positive things with the post-revolutionary period is that our cinemas were not inundated with Hollywood films. And so it allowed the film industry in Iran to really grow uh, uh, and sort of continue the art house practices from prior to the revolution. But now with this kind of these production houses becoming more and more prominent, that kind of filmmaking is making its way into the cinemas and making art house films really difficult to make. So. Uh, just to, to go back to your question from that little background, um, the sanctions have really, uh, it's made it much more difficult to produce films for filmmakers who don't have access to this kind of money anymore. Uh, the devaluation of the currency plays a large role, but more than anything, uh, the military and state apparatuses become really rich off of sanctions. I mean, this is something that doesn't get discussed a lot. You know, like, I don't understand how US policymakers don't understand this, that sanctions actually further entrench those in power, whereas who is hurting are the people, not those who are in power. So for places like the IRGC, actually, the sanctions have been fairly, very, very lucrative, actually. And so part of the folks that I am, again, focusing on, both from the book and in general right now, is a, a sector of this part of, of the military establishment. And again, they're not monolithic by any means and are com constantly competing against each other. But this one sector is pouring a lot of the money that they are getting through uh, enriching themselves through sanctions into media production. And it's creating this sort of uh, reality that we've been talking about here. So yeah, uh, Alex, it's uh, COVID obviously adds on top of it, but the bigger shock into the economy is sanctions. Well, I want to thank all uh, our presenters and everyone who asked the question. Uh, really enriching um, and, and generative uh, discussion that we've had. Um, Mona, did you? This was, yeah, thanks, Will, um, Narjus, and Omar, and Adam for such a great panel. So, um, such stimulating conversation. Um, we're going to break now for 15 minutes. We will resume at 2 30 with a second panel um, on. Um, State Policy, Industries, and Media Landscapes with uh, Nihat, K, Ziad, and Hatim. So we look forward to seeing you on the same link in uh, 15 minutes. Thank you so much and um, great work, everyone.